So we finished the last uh, segment talking about how in situations where what's needed is coordination, um, agreements can be self-enforcing. Uh, and the, the key argument there then is that is that external enforcement or law enforcement is, is not really needed in such situations. And we're going to illustrate that or develop that in a bit more detail uh, with going back to some of uh, some game theory. You'll recall from earlier in the quarter, we made a big deal about the prisoner's dilemma as a model of uh, the security dilemma, um, it, as a model of trade cooperation, and actually uh, in, uh, in the next uh, lecture, we're going to uh, talk about it as a, as a model of um, environmental cooperation. So this is the basic prisoner's dilemma. One of the key points uh, that, that game theorists and scholars of international politics uh, want to say is not everything is a prisoner's dilemma. This is a particularly tricky game to solve, right, as, as we discussed. Um, but there are other kinds of games, right? Sometimes you have different kinds of payoffs. So here's a, a simple um, a coordination game, right? And this essentially is the game that's, that's about whether you're going to drive on the, the right side or the left side of the road. It doesn't matter whether you drive on the left or the right. They both have the same payoff. What you want to avoid is a situation where somebody's driving on the right and somebody else is driving on the left, which is called a disaster. Um, lots of international agreements look like this. Managing things like air traffic, uh, sea lane management, Diplomatic communication. Just think about diplomacy. What language are, are we going to uh, conduct diplomacy in? Well, it doesn't matter if we do it in French, as was done for centuries, or whether we do it in English, which is typical now. But if one person's speaking French and the other one's speaking English, you're not going to uh, get along very well. Um, these seem like trivial examples, but an immense amount of international politics um, is about coordinating communication, coordinating traffic, so that all of the international trade and all of international diplomacy um, can get done. And I'm going to argue as well um, that it, that it uh, represents some more serious issues as well. But here's a slightly different game. This is called the stag hunt, and this comes from the famous dead French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, and the basic story here is you've got a bunch of hunters. They're out in the woods. Everybody wants to eat stag for dinner, right? They're all good carnivores. Stag's a fancy uh, word for deer. Um, they all want to eat venison, so that's got the highest payoff. Um, they, they'd rather eat that than, than eat rabbit um, or hare, as it was called uh, by Rousseau. Um, but if one person at one particular per, uh, point in time sees a rabbit close at hand, they're going to be tempted to grab the rabbit. Why? Because they don't know what the other people are going to do. And then the way this is set up is as long as I know that everybody else is going to stick with going for the stag, I'll stick in going for the stag. But if I think that my comrades might defect and go for the hair, then I want to defect as well because there's one right in front of me. Um, so so the, what this really is, this is a, an assurance game where as long as I'm assured that others are cooperating, I will cooperate too. I have no interest on my own in defecting because that gets me from a payoff of three uh, to a payoff of, of four. Um, and I'd rather have the four. So a lot of people are going to argue that in many cases, right, the security dilemma looks more like this than like a prisoner's dilemma. In particular, when you take into account the cost of buying weapons, uh, people are going to argue um, that it's better to cooperate than to defect. Um, because defecting will always end up getting you back here, and, and you're much worse off uh, because now you're spending a lot of money on an arms race. So, uh, so that's just one uh, example of the stag hunt, but a lot of people will say that that's uh, what international trade looks like and so on. The big point being, once you're here at 4-4, there's no incentive uh, to defect. And that's the key point about all of these coordination games. So again, just to, to look at uh, the, the, uh, how the iterated prisoner's dilemma becomes a stag hunt, right? We know if you play this game over and over again, if player A defects, Right, decides to move from cooperating to defecting, um, the, that um, player B is immediately going to defect as well. So essentially then, the, the value of defecting automatically uh, falls from four to two. So when you reduce the value of this uh, defecting while the other side is cooperating, this cooperate, cooperate uh, is going to end up looking like it's got higher utility than defecting, which is what the stag hunt uh, uh, presented. And again, this is a much easier game to solve. So this is the big question then about self-enforcement. 
right? Is there an incentive to defect? And the argument is that in this variety of games, once you're at this equilibrium, not in the prisoner's dilemma, uh, but in the stag hunt, once you're at the equilibrium, or in the pure coordination game, once you're in this uh, cooperate, cooperate, there is no incentive to defect, right? And that's the point that much international law is self-enforcing. Now, let's just look at one last game, which used to be called, if you want to look this one up, it's generally called Battle of the Sexes, and the story that goes with it is a great example of sexist gender bias in game theory. So I'm gonna call it Battle of the Partners. Uh, the story basically is you have two partners. Um, they des they're gonna to want to spend some time together. Are they going to spend it at the mountains or at the beach? Uh, uh, partner A would rather go uh, um, to the beach. Partner B would rather go to the mountains. But what they really, of course, want to avoid is a situation where one of them is at the mountains while the other's on the beach. Um, and it's, the, the big question is, right, so these are, are um, they're both equilibriums in the sense that once you're here, once you're at the beach, even the person who wanted to be at the mountains doesn't have an incentive to leave because, again, they don't want to be apart. Um, so the really interesting question in this case is, um, how does this get resolved? How is it decided whether you go to the mountains or, or the beach? Now, a simple solution, right, is whoever goes first. Right? If one person says, okay, I'm leaving first, I'm headed to the mountains, so it calls, it's okay, I'm at the mountains, well, then they've kind of won the game because the other one has no choice but to go there. That's a form of power. Right? The only way this game gets resolved um, right, is by one uh, player being able to convince the other somehow right, that we're going to go where I want to go. And that's a question of power. And that's r really where we want to go next which is um, even in some of these coordination situations, uh, not only is the only solution uh, come from the exercise of power, but if we think of these then as economic payoffs rather than vacation outcomes, um, whoever uh, gets, to, gets their way, nobody wants the one in the one, but whoever gets their choice is gonna end up more wealthy or more powerful, right? So the big point about this particular version of the game is even though this is a self-enforcing game, it's a self-enforcing game with big implications for power. And so uh, we want to then ask about what the role is of power in international law, and that is what we will do in our next video.